Greg Mankiw, thank you for joining us. It's nice to be with you. Let's talk about the use of markets to solve social problems. One serious social problem is the number of babies born every year to drug-addicted mothers. A charity has tried to deal with this problem by offering $300 cash to any drug-addicted woman willing to be sterilized. What do you think? Um, I think in some cases, actually, it's just putting a permanent IUD, and which is reversible. But let's assume that, very hypothetical, that they're actually permanent sterilization is in stake, not just sort of a, a form of semi-permanent birth control. Um, there's several things to think about. One is, how do you think about the, the life of the unborn um, child who would be born in a drug-addicted state? And how, you, how you weigh that, that welfare? I think that's a very hard thing to do, in part, because thinking about the, the welfare of a yet-to-be-born person is, is tricky. And then there's the question of to what extent is the mother making a voluntary decision uh, in this regard? Um, I, I don't think I personally would want to get involved in that charity. I wouldn't give money to that charity but I can understand why some people do. And I certainly wouldn't have the government go in and, and stop the charity uh, because I, I, I tend to want to decentralize decisions and let people make their own, li own life and make their own decisions. Uh, and I'm skeptical about central planners and government telling people what they can and can't do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't give money to that charity, but I wouldn't, try to, I wouldn't stop that charity from existing. And you wouldn't give money to it because you think there's something morally dubious about paying people to be sterilized, even for a good end? Um, it, I think it's hard. I think it's a morally very difficult question, and I think there's enough charities out there that are doing morally unambiguous things that I'd rather give my money to that char those, those unambiguous charities than the morally uh, ambiguous ones. And what's morally ambiguous here is that you're not sure that the woman who goes for the deal is really acting freely? Yes, exactly. I think, and I think the rational economic man model is useful in many, many situations in life, but I don't think it's ra useful in all situations in life. And a very poor drug addict, uh, that seems like a situation where they might not be able to make rational decisions for their own long-term self-interest. Um, so I, 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 that's, the, to me, the morally uh, difficult part of this case. What about a free market in kidneys? It's against the law in this country and most European countries. So that one seems much easier to me. Um, I have no problem with a free market in kidneys. Um, I, uh, right now, thousands of people die every year because they can't get a kidney. Uh, and a kid donating a kidney is, is, is not particularly risky for the person donating it. Um, and the system we have now, which is looking for voluntary transactions, is, sort of, is, not, is not working. People are not donating enough kidneys to save everybody who needs one. So I have no problem with people developing a market for kidneys. Now, the, the only argument I understand on the other side is that some very poor people might, like, like the drug addict in the previous example, not make a rational decision. Um, I'm less worried about that because I think donating kidneys is not that high risk. If you wanted to have a market for kidneys and saying you have to make at least $20,000 a year to, do to donate a kidney because you want to make sure you have a rational decision, uh, that would be fine. Uh, but I, my guess is if we, if we had that restriction, the very poor would say, why don't we get to donate our kidneys? We want to be able to do this too, because they would actually view it as a, as a reasonable thing to do. So taking that, the objection that you anticipated, that some people may sell kidneys out of desperate poverty, do you think that desperate economic need or circumstances is a kind of coercion that undermines the freedom of choice that normally recommends market? Um, I wouldn't call it coercion. What I'd call it is it limits your choices. Um, it may also limit your choices in ways that makes it harder to make rational choices for some people. Uh, but I'm, that I'm not even completely sure of. I think. Poor people can be rational people um, as well. And by rational choice, you mean? Acting in their own interest, um, doing what's, what's best for them given the um, circumstances they have. Uh, if we wanted, if we had, we're worried about poverty and, and income inequality, we should worry about poverty and income inequality directly and not say, gosh, because we're worried about poverty, we're not going to let this poor person sell his kidney and we'll let this person who needs a kidney die. That seems like a very odd way because it doesn't help the poor person. He's still poor. It doesn't 
certainly doesn't help the person who needs the kidney. He just, he's, he's, he's dead. Um, and so that, that seems like a, a very strange response to me to, um, to dealing with uh, income inequality. And if someone said a desperately poor peasant who has no other way of feeding her children or educating her children is not really choosing freely, it's not a voluntary exchange, it's coercive, what would you say? Well, let's suppose we had a free exchange for kidneys and we said, because we're worried about poor people not making free choices, you can't sell your kidney unless you have income above the poverty line. Unless you make at least $25,000 a year or $50,000 a year, you can't sell your kidney. Then we'd have a free market for kidneys. Everybody would get the kidney who wanted it. Kidney, presumably the price of kidneys would be higher because the poor people couldn't sell theirs. Who would object to that? I suspect the people who object were the poor people who want to sell their kidneys. Now, you're telling them, I'm sorry, you're not rational. You're, in des you're so desperate, they want to let you sell your kidney. And the, the poor peasant's saying, but I want to send my kids to college. I want to feed my children. And I'm happy to give up my kidney. And you're saying, no, no, I don't believe you. I'm posing my judgments on you. I'm not letting you make that choice. So the market for kidneys is going to operate only here among rich people. I'm not sure that's better. But if you really are worried about coercion for the very poor, I think that's the solution, not banning the market for kidneys altogether. You say, let the rich people have their market for kidneys and let the, we will we'll exclude the poor because we don't trust them to make decisions in their own best interest. All right, now let's suppose that an impoverished Indian peasant sells a kidney and is able to send her son to get an education. And a few years later, the same broker comes She's got a second child whom she would like to send to college and wants that education for the second child badly enough that she's willing to sell her second kidney, in effect committing suicide. But it's worth it to her. Should she be able to? Well, I think there are some cases where we look at this decision and say, that's not rational. I mean, I think in this particular case, I feel very comfortable saying to that person, I'm sorry, you're not making a rational choice in this case, and we're not going to let you do that. So I, I feel perfectly comfortable with that. But she's willing to sacrifice her life. It's not implausible. Not even, I'm not even sure I see why it's irrational. So that both of her children will be able to get the education that will enable them to get, get ahead in life. Why is that irrational? I think there's certain things that we view as sort of prima facie irrational. And maybe it's not. This is her particular case. Maybe she could convince me in her particular case. She's thought through all the possibilities and given the options open to her, this is a rational thing to do. But as a matter of public policy, I can imagine that there are certain things that we're just going to sort of rule out as irrational. So we don't, we don't, you know, I feel perfectly, perfectly comfortable having a market in kidneys because people only need one and hmm. they, it's not a very invasive procedure to, to take out uh, the second. Um, I wouldn't let, have a, a market in, uh, in uh, heart transplants because people only have one and you take it out, you're, you're in bad shape. So um, I feel perfectly comfortable sort of drawing a line between things that are sort of prima facie irrational and things that a rational person would do. And for example, it strikes me, we, given that a person will often freely donate one kidney to somebody as a charitable act, um, it, and that's sort of, we view that as an admirable thing to do. It seems odd to say that it's, it's pretty much irrational to do it for $50,000. Whereas people, we wouldn't let people voluntarily say, here, I love you so much, here, I'm gonna give you my heart uh, for a heart transplant. We say, no, 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 that's not, an irrational, that's not a rational thing that somebody would do. We don't view that as a charitable act, we view that as a bizarrely uh, irrational one. Do you think if we had a market in kidneys, those people who now voluntarily, freely donate as a gift, an organ, would just many people do that, or maybe not? Oh no, it might change. I, I, could, I could easily imagine that would change once the market for kidneys de became developed. So, for, to give you another sort of example, in the days before fire insurance, when somebody house burned down, the community would get together and build them a new house. That's a small town. Um, once it's fire insurance. When your, house, when your neighbor's house burns down, you don't rush to say, I'll help you build a new one. You assume he has fire insurance and he'll hire a builder to build it. Um, so yes, so I think some community values probably um, change as, as things get commercialized. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's probably just as well that my neighbors have fire insurance. I'm not a particularly good builder. They wouldn't want me building them a house even if, even if their house did burn down. Um, so I think the fact we've commercialized fire insurance is, uh, it, in some sense it does erode community values, but it's, that's, that's probably okay. And if it eroded the altruism of donating kidneys, would we admire people who donated kidneys under the market system, or we would, would we consider that they were squandering something for which they could be making money? I think 
different people would probably view it differently. I, I view that as a relatively small issue compared to the thousands of people who are dying every year. So mm -hmm. whether we, if our view of kidney donation changed, uh, the fact that we, nobody would be dying of, 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 of kidney failure, I think things considered that we'd be in a better world. Now suppose there were someone who wanted to buy a kidney, not because he needed it to survive, but let's say that he was an eccentric art collector who wanted to shellac the kidney and put it on his coffee table as a conversation piece. Should that be permitted? Well, I'm, I'm reluctant to have the government come in and tell people what they can and can't do. So I'm, I'm, I, I think that's very distasteful. I would discourage both the person giving, selling the kidney and the person buying it from, from rethinking their values. Um, but I, that, that's very different from saying that I would tell the government to come in and, and stop that voluntary transaction. It would be efficient, Pareto well, efficient. From an economist's normal definition of Pareto efficiency, absolutely. There would be mutual gains from that trade. If both people did it voluntarily, um, yes. Both are better off, nobody else is worse off. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, I personally view it as distasteful, but as I said, I, I wouldn't get involved in that, but I'm perfectly, but if somebody else wants to, I wouldn't stop them from doing so. But here's why I'm pressing, pressing you on this. I'm trying to get at how you view the status of preferences, because so much of economic analysis, as you've described it, involves mutual gains to trade, allocating goods according to the willingness of pay, all measured by the preferences of the participants in the deals. But if some preferences are qualitatively higher than others, if some preferences are perverse and uh, morally objectionable, doesn't that call into question a way of thinking about economics and social choice that rests everything on satisfying preferences? It's, it's absolutely the case that when people talk about Pareto efficiency, um, that's taking other people's prefer preferences as given and, and showing a respect for those preferences. To the extent we don't respect other people's preferences, then um, that leads to a whole variety of public policy prescriptions that we might do otherwise. So for example, you know, when a drug addict buys drugs, you could say, well, that's a voluntary transaction because, we, um, uh, because the drug addict wants those drugs. And there's two arguments, one, the, why you might put aside that. One is you might say, gosh, that, that, that drug addict is not rational, not looking at their own long-term self-interest. But you might also say, we as a society have decided that we're not going to respect those preferences. Uh, um, as, a, as an individual, I'm reluctant to impose my judgments on other people. So I'm perfectly happy to, to tell people, you really shouldn't, you should spend less time doing video games, you shouldn't go um, out to the dwarf tossing uh, contest. Uh, but I'm reluctant to say, as a matter of social policy, we should be imposing my preferences on someone else because I don't want other people to impose their preferences on me. And I recognize that people are, are very heterogeneous. And the only way we're going to survive together, given our heterogeneous preferences, is by not imposing our preferences, respecting differences. Uh, and saying as a matter of social policy, as long as you're not hurting other people, we're going to tend to respect uh, what your preferences are. If, if there were qualitatively higher and lower preferences, some worthy, some unworthy, would that, as a matter of uh, moral philosophy, would that in any way call into question efficiency as a standard, efficiency in the economist sense of the term? If you, ha if you had, um, better preferences and worse preferences, yeah. and you said, we're going to condition social policy on that, that is, social policy is going to try to promote better preferences and yes. worse preferences, then absolutely, the economist's notion of efficiency goes out the window. Because economist's notion of efficiency is based on respect for people's preferences as they are. Uh, and if you think social policy should be imposing preferences on people, saying these are good preferences and we want you to have them, then that gives you a very different role for the state than the, the, the Pareto efficiency would as a normal standard right. criterion that economists use. Would? It, it would. It would, it would. It would give a very different role for the state. If, for example, you thought that you know, video games were it's a bad use of people's times and reading books were a good use of people's times and, the state, and you're going to use the government to impose those preferences on people, then you might want to tax video games and subsidize books. 
But you wouldn't be for that? No, because I don't think that it's the government's job to tell people what their preferences should be. I think government is something we do together uh, for some joint activities. And ultimately, when the people who act together to impose preferences, what that basically means is the majority in a democratic system, the majority is getting together and imposing their preferences on minorities. Majoritarianism. Majorita majoritarianism. But I, think that's I think that's a dangerous uh, thing to do in a, in a society of, with lots of different kinds of people. You speak, Greg, of imposing views about preferences, imposing judgments about preferences through the government, and, and I see the force of that worry. But isn't there some space between imposing and being agnostic? We're both educators. Isn't part of the purpose of education in a democratic society to invite students to reflect on their preferences and possibly to improve them? Oh, sure, absolutely. No, and I, I think that's one of the great things about education is that it, it does change people fundamentally, um, but it does, doesn't do that in a, in a centralized authoritarian kind of way. It's not like the government coming in and saying, we'd like you to change your preferences in this way. I mean, authoritarian governments often do that. That's, that scares me. And I don't even be comfortable with a democratically run authoritarian government because that's basically the, de the majority imposing their will on the minority. Um, so I, I want to allow people to, to be different and have social policy reflect those differences and respect those differences. Greg Mankiw, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Thank you.